okay? Well, welcome everyone to the Lyles College of Engineering Tech Talks celebrating National Engineers Week. My name is Clarissa Condit and I'm a third year student in the Geomatics program. I'm currently a surveying and math tutor at Fresno City College. Today's presenter is Ken Mimi, board chair and president of TOWL. Mr. Mimi has more than 30 years of geomatics engineering experience. He joined TOWL immediately following the completion of his bachelor's degree from Fresno State in geomatics engineering with a dual major in geography from Fresno State. He plans, develops, and establishes policies and objectives of TOWL in accordance with board directives. He manages the efforts of senior executives and members of the board and works with them to develop current and long range objectives, policies and procedures. He also has management and principal oversight of hundreds of projects in the federal, state, local and private sectors. Mr. Mimi is proud to be a product of one of the nation's top geomatics engineering programs and hopes that providing his own experience, he can help maintain the program at its highest level. In 2019, he was named top dog for Fresno State with the Outstanding Alumni Award for his remarkable accomplishments and achievements in the field of geomatics. He is also a registered professional photogrammetrist by the State of Oregon, Board of Examiners for Engineering and Land Surveying, and certified photogrammetrist by the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. We'd also like to give a warm welcome from all of our guests from Cell from Fowler High School. <laughs> Thank you for joining. And as we get on with the presentation, uh, if you can ask your questions in the Q&A box and not the chat, we'll be, we'll be able to read the questions as he presents. Thank you, Clarissa. I appreciate that very much. And thank you for inviting me here today. I appreciate this opportunity to share um, my experiences and knowledge about geomatics engineering here on National Engineers Week. I have a presentation, a uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I'm going to uh, share my screen now so that you can see that. Well, thank you again. I appreciate that very nice introduction. Um, as Clarissa said, I'm Ken Mimi. I work for Towel Incorporated. I'm the president of the company and one of its owners. Um, graduated from the university there at Fresno in 1986. As much as I'd like to be younger, uh, <laughs> I have been at this for a while. Um, and I am also the, uh, the current chairperson, <clears throat> excuse me, of the um, California State University Fresno Geomatics Engineering Advisory Council. And Clarissa, I noticed your shout out to the folks from uh, Fowler High School. Uh, I grew up in Fowler. I'm a Fowler Red Cat, and so a special hello to all of those Red Cats. But welcome everybody else uh, in addition. So this is National Engineers Week and National Eng Engineers Week uh, was founded in 1951 by the National Society of Professional Surveyors. And it happens to be this week here in 2021. <clears throat> this week is dedicated to ensuring a diverse and well-educated future in the engineering workforce uh, by increasing understanding of and interest in engineering and technology careers. So that's off of the National Professional or National Society of Professional Engineers uh, website that you can see there on the screen. And I encourage you to visit that when you have some time. So as part of National Engineers Week, uh, I'm here to introduce you to geomatics engineering, that profession. Um, and I wanna note that um, several of the slides that I have here at first, it's quite a bit of text, but don't despair. Um, uh, as my pres presentation progresses, I do have quite a few graphics, many of them uh, what I think are really cool and interesting graphics that I believe will interest you. So let's talk a bit about geomatics engineering. So here's a definition of geomatics engineering from the Fresno State Geomatics Engineering Program website. <clears throat> it states that uh, geomatics engineering is the management of global infrastructure through the collection, measuring, monitoring, and archiving of geospatial data. 
Uh, geomatics engineers contribute to the welfare and safety of the public through administering appropriate research and advanced mapping techniques. And you can see the website address there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, that's the homepage, so to speak, of the uh, program, the geomatics engineering program at Fresno State. Again, another uh, location I encourage you to visit when you have some time. So this is a, you know, this is a very, very, very good definition of what the profession does. And today, I'm going to spend some time showing you some of the things that geomatics engineers do, sharing with you, and um, uh, hopefully get you a bit excited about this profession. Well, there's another definition that I like as well, uh, mainly because it's a fairly succinct definition, and I think it's a little more relatable to most people who don't at present have exposure to geomatics engineering. So let's look at this one. This is from Wikipedia and uh, the, the website where I uh, obtained this definition and seen many times, frankly, um, is, uh, is at the bottom of the screen. It says geomatics engineers apply engineering principles to spatial information and implement relational data structures involving measurement sci sciences, thus using geomatics and acting as spatial information engineers. And again, I think that's a really nice, succinct definition that I hope is, is clear to everyone. Now, there are several subdisciplines of geomatics engineering that I'm gonna talk about. Now, I won't, I won't have time to go over all of these today, but uh, these are disciplines that are essentially specialties within the field of geomatics engineering. So some of them you may have heard of them and some of them not. And I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna go over a few of these, share with you some of the things that these various subdisciplines do. And really, I think an important point for everyone today is that even by talking about all of these different subjects, I'm really just scratching the surface of what geomatics engineering is all about because there's so many aspects to it. So some, some of these uh, you may have heard of geodesy, geophysics, probably the most common, commonly known is surveying or land surveying. I'm gonna talk about that today. Hydrography or hydrographic surveying, photogrammetry. That's another one, it's, it's used quite a bit um, in today's world, uh, but most people don't recognize that word. So I'm gonna spend a little time on that. It's related to remote sensing. Uh, also, geographic information systems or land information systems is another subdiscipline of geomatics engineering and cartography and navigation, which are probably a little more familiar to most people. Well, what kinds of benefits does geomatics engineering provide to society? Well, there are many uh, that benefit. There are many aspects of society that benefit from the application of the principles, the practices, and the technologies of geomatics engineering. So here's a few obvious examples. Geomatics engineers, and in particular land surveyors, contribute to the termination and documentation of real property ownership. So the places where you live, the places where you work and so on, those properties are owned by uh, private citizens. Sometimes they're owned by um, businesses. Sometimes they're owned by governments such as the state or federal government. And all of that information needs to be clarified and documented. And that's a primary role, but certainly not the only one of geomatics engineers. And geomatics engineers also touch your life every day. They're an important part of the processes to design and build infrastructure, places where you live, where you work, where you shop, where you recreate, and where you obtain your services. In addition, geomatics engineers are an important part of the processes for transportation, such as uh, the the uh, designing and building of roads that you drive on, railroads that you ride on, and the airports where you depart from and land at when you travel by airline. So those are fairly common things that, uh, that we're all involved with in some manner each day. Uh, but how many of you knew that geomatics engineers are an important part of that process? Now, there are some less obvious aspects of uh, our society that geomatics engineers are involved with and the principles, practices, and technologies they use are applied. So take a look at a few of these. And mind you, this is just a small sampling. The, um, the computer and mobile telephone applications that you depend on for geospatial information, things like Bing or Google Earth. I'm gonna talk about Google Earth a little in a little while. Uh, MapQuest, Waze, these are just a few examples. And there are many other applications that you download on your phones 
they have a geospatial component and the methodologies that they're created from depend in part on geomatics engineering. In addition to that, um, there's navigation of aircraft and ships and now uh, autonomous vehicles. In addition, some types of medical and dental imaging and 3D modeling depend on geomatics engineering for part of their development and use. So if you've ever visited, say, the dentist and they take a three-dimensional view of, of your teeth and your palate, uh, many of the applications of geomatics engineering are applied in those manners. Uh, movies and video games. This is another place where the technologies and principles and practices of geomatics engineering apply. And there are ways you'll see with some of the technologies I'm gonna speak about today that they get used very effectively to help the movie industry, in particular with animation or very complex scenes that they create. Um, if video games, for example, have any of you ever used iRacing? A uh, number of the racetracks that are developed in that game started from a geomatics engineering mapping effort, and they were used to create the animations uh, to a very accurate degree geospatially uh, in those games. And then space exploration. Just recently, a new rover landed on Mars. And if you take some time to go out to NASA's website and watch some of the uh, videos about that, that landing and some of the things that the rover's going to do, it's incredible how many of the aspects of that mission involve geomatics engineering as part of the process. So, I'm going to talk about a number of aspects of these disciplines of geomatics engineering. Uh, and as I do so, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to Clarissa and she'll let me know that a question's come in and I'll do my best to answer those questions if you have them. We'll also have an opportunity at the end of the discussion for questions and answers then too. So since geomatics engineering applies to all aspects of uh, society and our world, Let's start underwater. Uh, there's hydrography or hydrographic surveying, which is a branch of geomatics engineering that involves the art and the science and the technologies, particularly sonar, which is uh, sound navigation and ranging and other types of related technologies. And when they're used in combination, they can be used to measure and characterize the physical features of bodies of water and the natural and man-made features adjacent to them. And so what you see here on the screen is some pictures. On the left-hand side, you see a hydrographic survey boat. Uh, these images are courtesy of eTrack Inc. in San Rafael, California, a firm that specializes in this type of work. Uh, in the middle section there, you see a, a, a sonar sensing device underwater. And then to the right, some of the types of uh, graphics that can be produced. These are geospatially accurate representations of objects and terrain underneath the water. It's pretty amazing. You can see this incredible detail. Uh, this kind of detail is captured with a technology called multi-beam uh, hydrographic surveying or multi-beam sonar. So what are some of the applications of hydrographic surveying? Well, some of these will probably be obvious to you, and then there are a few that may be, be new uh, information for you, but you know, surveying, mapping, and modeling of underwater topography, which is also often known as bathymetry and other types of underwater features, as you saw in the previous graphics. Also, uh, many types of marine engineering, construction, and dredging. Dredging is important to keep waterways open for ship navigation, and uh, occasionally for other purposes. <clears throat> uh, mapping and monitoring of underwater infrastructure. So this could include pipelines or the foundations of bridges that pass over water. It may also include underwater structures that are built to support other structures above the water, besides bridges, things like, things like uh, that. Uh, it's also used effectively for environmental monitoring, monitoring and restoration. Maritime navigation is another use. And of course, offshore oil exploration drilling is known well to many people. But also, one of the more interesting aspects of hydrographic surveying is marine archaeology, searching for items that are underwater, um, uh, historic shipwrecks, for example. Is, is one. And um, if you go out to the, to the internet, there are a number of websites where this technology is used and there's some incredible things that can be done with it to uncover the story of, of historic shipwrecks. 
Uh, here's an interesting graphic. You know, in addition to uh, the large size vessel that which a person operates that you saw in a, a previous slide, here's a slide that shows an autonomous vehicle that carries a hydrographic survey system, a multi-beam sonar system in this case. So this is at the USS Arizona Memorial in Hawaii. Uh, if you look down in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, you see a red oval, and that is representing inside of it an autonomous vehicle. It's operated by a person um, just like you would operate an, an autonomous, autonomous aircraft from shore, uh, and it's being operated in a way that is collecting information underneath and near this memorial. And, and so to the right, you can see images that are created from the sunken USS Arizona. And you can see the incredible detail that's possible with that. These images are also, again, courtesy of eTrack Inc. in San Rafael, California. Well, let's talk a little bit about land surveying. So we'll move from the water to the land. Now, land surveying is a part of geomatics engineering that probably most people in society are familiar with, uh, largely because you get an opportunity to see people working in these capacities a lot out and about in, in a, variety of area, a variety of areas. So on the screen, there are some images here uh, that uh, show a variety of, of land surveying instrumentation, as well as some folks working in the office. And so this uh, discipline and these technologies are used in urban areas and rural areas, sometimes very remote. And so you can see some neat pictures there of um, um, what are termed a GPS, Global Positioning System, or GNSS, which is Global Navigation Satellite System, uh, receivers off to the lower right and to the right um, that are being used to collect information for positioning and off to the left some more traditional uh, instruments that are termed total stations and levels that are used for gathering information uh, for land surveying purposes. So what are some of the applications of land surveying? Well some of these will be quite obvious to many of you um, but some others might be uh, a little less, and so I, I want to provide you with at least a sampling of the kinds of things that land surveyors get involved with. And again, I want to emphasize this is really just a small subset. But establishing geodata control networks. These are the geospatial reference frames that nearly every type of project needs to be referenced to. Uh, it's a uh, component of nearly every project that involves geomatics engineering and a very important one at that because all of the future work after this control network is established is referenced to, the, to that network and it allows everything to be, to be created in the same geospatial reference frame in an accurate manner. Um, we already uh, discussed briefly the determination and documentation of real properties, so what would be commonly termed boundary surveying. Related to that is right-of-way engineering, determining where uh, legal rights of way and property exist for typically for route projects such as railroads and highways and, and so on. Uh, topographic mapping and other types of services that support engineering design. Construction also, uh, so engineers are in, excuse me, geomatics engineers are involved in the engineering and construction process from beginning to end. Um, and when you get to the construction part, there's layout, there's management, and also as-built documentation, meaning when the project is finished, there's documentation that provides information about the final status of the construction. Environmental management is, is another uh, component of land surveying. Here's one that's probably not nearly as well known, but movement and deformation monitoring. The, the, the te technologies and techniques of land surveying can be used to monitor things like dams for potential movement that could mean that there is a problem. Um, and there's other types of deformation monitoring as well, buildings. Uh, there's, there's circumstances, say for example, in, in large urban areas, say under downtown New York, downtown San Francisco, downtown Los Angeles, where when there is underground construction going on, there needs to be monitoring at the surface to be sure that that underground construction is not compromising the foundations of buildings on the surface. Uh, and then emergency response. Sometimes uh, land surveyors are called into action to help out with gathering information that's important to respond to emergencies. So things like landslides or infrastructure failure are examples. 
And I have just a couple of graphic examples here for you, some graphics to show. Here's one land surveying application. It's a fairly common application, topographic surveying. And you can see on the right-hand side, an incredible level of detail that land surveyors are able to gather and then represent so that a civil engineer in this case can use the information to design improvements to this area. This happens to be a site in San Francisco called the Japantown Peace Plaza. And um, uh, as, you, as I said, you can see an incredible amount of detail showing both at ground and above ground features. Another common application in land surveying is um, uh, real property boundary surveys, which I mentioned previously. This happens to be a graphic that represents the cover page of a multi-document uh, property boundary survey at the Presidio of Monterey in Monterey, California. Uh, our firm had the, uh, I would say the privilege really to work on this project a couple of years ago. Be, and it was the, the first comprehensive boundary survey of this site in nearly a hundred years. And you can see the incredible amount of detail just on this one sheet. Um, it was a multi-month long process and quite fascinating delving into all kinds of history of the local area in order to come up with a result. Well, in addition to the traditional tools that land surveyors use, I want to also point out that it's becoming more and more common for all types of geomatics engineers to use LIDAR technology. So I'm gonna transition into a discussion about that. Um, Light detection and ranging, or LIDAR as the acronym, is a technology that involves a sensor that emits laser light pulses, and, and then it measures the time it takes the light waves to travel from the sensor to the target objects that they reflect from, and then return to the sensor. And these uh, times can be translated into ranges or distances. And by knowing the distances among the many ranges that can be measured through these sensors, they can be used to develop digital 3D representations of the target objects, whatever it is that you're attempting to survey and map. And that may be the terrain, it may be something above the terrain, it may be objects. I'm gonna actually show you quite a few examples of this here in just a few minutes. An important part here of this discussion though is that LIDAR technology, as it's developed and deployed for geomatics engineering applications, has advanced significantly during the last two decades, such that it's become a reliable, valuable, and frankly ubiquitous geomatics engineering tool that's used on a daily basis and can provide some incredible results. And these sensors can be used in a variety of ways, these LIDAR sensors. So for most geomatics engineering applications, LIDAR sensors may be operated in either stationary mode or static mode or a mobile manner in some fashion. So static terrestrial laser scanners or scanning, uh, the acronym being STLS, and there are others, but I really like these. Um, in this case, the sensor is mounted on a tripod or some sort of other stationary platform. Then there's mobile terrestrial laser scanning or MTLS. In this case, the, center, the sensors are mounted on or in a vehicle such as a truck or an SUV, or it may be on a watercraft, such as a boat. And I have an example of that here in, to, to show you. In addition, there are um, airborne or aerial laser scanning systems. Uh, the common acronym is ALS. And in this case, the sensor is mounted on or in an aircraft, such as a fixed wing airplane, a rotary wing helicopter, or an unmanned aerial vehicle, what, what's commonly called a drone. We do have a question. Uh, are land surveyors the first ones to start on construction projects? Very often land surveyors are at the, be at the beginning stages of construction, yes. Maybe not the very first, but they're involved at the initial stages and they're involved throughout the process to perform a variety of tasks. And that can be to lay out the locations where items may be built, uh, to sometimes determine the limits of where items can be built, meaning defining the real property boundary on which the improvements are occurring. It can also involve um, monitoring the construction as it's completed to be sure that it's meeting the construction specifications. So there's a whole variety of ways that land surveyors are involved. And yes, from beginning, 
all the way through the end to the point of creating as-built documentation to show what the site looks like in its final form after construction. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of um, static trace terrestrial laser scanning technology and how it's used. So it can be used for surveying and mapping and modeling complex features and landscapes. And I have a few examples here to show you with some, some neat graphics. Uh, something called building information modeling. This is where the technology is used often indoors, uh, although it is often combined with outdoor scanning as well. But indoors uh, to model in three dimensions all aspects of a building and then use that information to model and to manage the building in many different ways. Uh, re restoration and preservation of structures and cultural resources is another use of this technology. Construction management, monitoring, and as-built documentation, which I was just talking about, where this tool can be used to accomplish those objectives. But uh, how about a few other things that are a little, little less common, but very interesting. Uh, this technology is used for crime scene and accident scene mapping. In fact, many police departments and other emergency response departments around this country own and use this STLS type technology. And when there is a, a significant crime scene where they think the technology will be beneficial or an accident scene, they'll take the technology to the site and gather an enormous amount of three-dimensional information that can be used to uh, provide a, a variety of purposes in an investigation. Uh, environmental remediation is another example of an application. Volumetrics, this is where you're determining the volume of uh, various objects. Most commonly, it might be mining materials that are piled up into stockpiles or something like this. Um, and also archeology. span You know, one of the ways that this technology was used um, is to uh, capture uh, the shape, size, and so on of historic objects where touching them is either difficult or perhaps not ideal because it could compromise the uh, uh, sensitive nature of that particular object. So one example that comes to mind are the stone heads that are on Easter Island that have been studied for years and years um, by a professor at UCLA and others and they can be scanned and created in 3D and used for a variety of, of purposes. So what you see here at the bottom right of the screen, there's a picture of uh, a um, high definition laser scanner mounted on a tripod. This happens to be a photograph that is available on the Fresno State Geomatics Engineering website. Uh, the individuals in the picture there are uh, Dr. Peterson, one of the faculty members and a student. And below it is a rendered or colorized scan. And you can see the level of detail that can be captured through this process. Um, by the way, this uh, instrument that you see in the picture there that the air, red arrow is pointing to is um, an instrument produced by Ly Leica Geosystems. And I'd just like to point out um, and thank Leica Geosystems. Leica Geosystems donates uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment to the program at Fresno State for its use. And um, it's a great benefit to the students. So here's another example of how static terrestrial laser scanning can be applied to a project. This is an electric substation and you can see it's, it's been colorized. The colors represent um, different heights above the ground of objects. And in this case, you can see uh, the level of detail that's possible here. You can imagine with some other kinds of measurement types of tools and technologies, it might be difficult to gather this much information. But when you're using an instrument that can collect 300 plus points uh, per square meter to define an object, uh, it's incredible the level of detail that can be shown. And so um, designers can use this information as well as maintenance personnel for a whole variety of applications and uh, one of the great things about collecting data in this manner is that once you go out to the site and collect it, you have an enormous amount of information at your fingertips in the office. And therefore, if you need to make measurements of objects that perhaps weren't requested or obvious at the outset of your survey, you can still uh, make those measurements without having to revisit the project site. And that can have impacts on cost and safety that are beneficial. 
And this uh, set of graphics shows a scan at Pier 39, which is a tourist location in San Francisco, California. Uh, some of the insets that you see are um, uh, what I would call frame grabs or enlargements of some of the areas that were scanned. And once again, you can see the incredible level of detail. So this particular project, the entire pier was scanned for um, a variety of um, civil engineering improvements that were going to be made. And so the amount of detail that was necessary in order to design those and then ultimately construct them, this technology lended itself very well to that purpose. And, and so these are really some incredible graphics um, to show the level of detail that's achievable here. And one last application I wanna point out here is um, down in the lower left corner, it's a little difficult to see, but there's an instrument down there with a person standing next to it, it's mounted on a tripod. It is, it is a um, high definition laser scanning instrument. The photograph or the image that you see on the top here is actually a photograph. It's a photograph taken at Chrissy Field in San Francisco, looking toward the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, the image that you see below that, which looks very similar, but you notice the information in the background uh, disappears. Um, it's a scan. It is a point cloud that's been uh, rendered to have color based on a photography that was taken simultaneously with, with the scan. And you can notice that the level of detail between the two is, in, is very much the same. The only thing that drops out are those features far in the background that are beyond the distance of the capability of the scanner to collect information on them but just notice the similarity in the two. And uh, every time I look at this set of pictures, it just amazes me, or images, I should say, um, it just amazes me how much detail there is using this technology. Well, let's take a look at what happens when you put a terrestrial scanner, a high definition scanner on some sort of a, a vehicle and you move it. Um, there are applications for mobile terrestrial laser scanning or MTLS. Certainly, uh, some, some examples here, surveying, mapping, and modeling complex or linear infrastructure. So there, this type of technology is particularly well suited to linear infrastructure such as roads or railroads or shorelines, things like this. Um, construction management, monitoring and as-built documentation, again, it's a powerful tool in, in those realms. Environmental management and remediation is another use of this technology. Uh, also, asset inventories and management. So there are many places in the United States where these types of systems are being used. Uh, they're driven along roadways, highways, and they are used to collect information about the infrastructure along the road, such as signs and um, emergency locations for uh, telephones, uh, the locations of light poles, guardrails, and all kinds of other information, maybe even including the paint striping on the road, and then managing that in a geographic information system for long-term um, maintenance of those investments. I already mentioned shoreline map mapping, and then volumetrics is another one where the technology can be used, say, for example, to drive around a, um, a mining site and collect information to calculate volumes of material that are removed from the site or stockpiled on the site. And again, this is just a small sampling of the kinds of ways this technology can be used. <clears throat> the graphic you see at the lower right is a graphic of a uh, highway interchange, a portion of it. Um, here's, here's another application of mobile terrestrial laser scanning. Uh, what you see there in the middle of the screen toward the bottom is the uh, sensor itself. There are actually multiple scanners mounted into a structure uh, that's then connected to a computer system and operated on the back of a vehicle, in this case, a truck. And um, um, for this particular uh, project, the data were collected at an airport. And one of the benefits there is that in an airport, it's very difficult to shut down runways from air traffic. There's a lot of safety concerns, there's in impositions on the public. So when you can have a mobile unit like this, it can go out and drive around the site and capture data rather quickly in a very short time span, it really helps to accommodate a lot of the needs of data acquisition for a variety of design and construction applications. And at the same time, really minimizes the impacts of safety and, and imposition on the users of the airport. Now, here's another mobile 
mapping or mobile laser scanning application, you notice in the upper right, I put terrestrial in quotes because the data are not collected from a vessel that's operating on land, but in fact, the information that's being collected is land-based. So what you see in the, uh, on the right side is a, um, a boat. It's a hydrographic survey boat and mounted on the top of it, if you look at that inset photo down toward the bottom, uh, is a high definition laser scanner. And uh, that scanner can be used in conjunction with the multi-beam sonar system underneath the boat so that as you're traveling along a shoreline, you can collect the information of the objects and terrain underwater simultaneously while the information along the shoreline is being collected by the HD laser scanner. So uh, this kind of application is becoming more and more common. And is, as you can see from the graphic, the, the level of detail that's possible is just incredible. Well, in addition to using these laser scanners uh, on tripods, on vehicles such as trucks, on boats, they can also be used in the air and in fact have been for roughly 20 years, at least in the commercial sector, um, longer than that on the military side. And so let's talk a little bit about airborne or aerial laser scanning technology. So here are a few uh, example applications, topographic mapping. Now, one of the benefits of airborne laser scanning is that it has the ability to collect an enormous amount of information in a short amount of time. And the laser pulses have the ability to penetrate around, not through, but around vegetation that's on the site. So it's one of the few technologies that's, that's very effective, both in terms of its results and in terms of cost effectiveness and efficiency that can map large areas that are covered by vegetation. And as long as the vegetation isn't too dense, it does an excellent job of collecting information. In addition, depending on the density of the data that are collected, you can also collect what I term microterrain. That's very small changes in the terrain that otherwise would be very difficult to capture using other types of technologies um, other than LIDAR. So, and just as a point, down in the lower right, you'll see a couple of graphics. That graphic that you see um, that looks like an instrument, that's what it is. It's a um, LIDAR sensor built by Teledyne Optech. In this case, it happens to be a, an Orion sensor. That's the name of it. There's also another one that looks very similar called Galaxy. And these instruments can collect, uh, today. in today's world, these types of instruments made by um, this company and, and several others can collect more than a million points per second if necessary. Uh, it's just really incredible how much data can be collected. If you go back 20 years, most airborne LiDAR sensors back in the late 1990s were collecting data in the realm of about 25,000 points per second, which at the time I recall thinking was just incredible. But now as technologies advanced and the sensors are collecting a million points per second or more, it's, it's, it's just that much more amazing. And they're typically collected in a series of overlapping swaths. That's what the graphic, admittedly a bit small, but the graphic at the lower right-hand corner shows those somewhat lavender colored uh, swaths are LIDAR swaths that are collected over the terrain. That, this happens to be um, a graphic of a project up near Mount Whitney in the Sierra Nevada of California. In addition to topographic mapping, Airborne LiDAR technology is, is also used for 3D modeling uh, of urban landscapes, you know, downtowns of say New York or Paris or, or San Francisco or others. Um, and it's also used to map electric power lines, in other words, objects above the ground. And I have a, an example of that to show you here shortly. We it's have used a question. To, okay. How accurate would you say these measurements are? Well, it can vary depending on the technology. Laser technology itself is very accurate, what, um, meaning that you can measure down sometimes with lasers, given the nature of the, um, the sensor, uh, down into the millimeter range of accuracies. But you have to put into perspective that when a laser sends out its, its pulses of light and they reflect off of objects, the albedo of that object has some bearing on the accuracy of the result. 
as do a variety of other factors. And so for, for practical purposes, when you're talking about static scanning, um, the accuracy of the result can be down in the order of um, you know, a centimeter or less if, if the project is approached properly. Uh, in the case of mobile applications, a moving platform creates a few more challenges, but you can achieve accuracies near that result as well. And from airborne platforms, depending again on the approach that's taken, um, we have seen, for example, with our sensor, our airborne ladder sensors, that we can achieve accuracies uh, below a tenth of a foot. So down in the range reliably of about half of that. So now that doesn't mean that it applies to all applications because when you get into areas where there are obstructions, say vegetation, it can reduce the accuracy uh, ultimately of the, the LIDAR point clouds as they represent the ground. But it doesn't mean though that it'll necessarily occur, it just, it, it's a case by case basis. So what you'll find is that these technologies have the potential for incredible accuracy um, of magnitudes that are certainly applicable to so many things in, in civil and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and so on, <clears throat> that uh, their uses are, are ubiquitous these days. And I wanna make a little caveat here that the accuracies I'm talking about um, can vary between the horizontal component and the vertical component. So, so that needs to be uh, at least something to consider. I guess the point is really that it's, it's, a, it's a technology that allows highly accurate work to be done um, depending on what your need for accuracy is. The other thing about them is that they're precise, and, and this will give me an opportunity to present that concept. Accuracy and precision are not the same thing, at least not to a geomatics engineer. Precision is repeatability. And so the ability of these instruments to repeat the same results over and over again is excellent. Accuracy is how well the result compares to its true value. And so uh, accuracy has a number of components associated with it to achieve your final result. It's not just the technology or the measurement itself. Okay. Um, some other applications here, environmental management, such as management of forests and wetlands. This technology is commonly used for that. Emergency response, this is another one. In, in response, typically after wildfires to map the, the terrain and to see the uh, level of impact of the wildfire. Landslides, um, this technology is used widely for not only uh, attempting to mitigate landslides before they occur, but also to respond after they occur, um, to map areas that have been flooded if there are earthquakes, to map changes that occur due to earthquakes. And speaking of earthquakes, this technology can also be used to detect earthquake faults. Uh, our firm has actually been involved in, in several projects specifically for this purpose. Uh, and the reason that the technology works so well is, is again, because of its, its ability to penetrate around vegetation and show changes in the terrain that are underneath that vegetation. And so you get to see patterns and those patterns can often show the potential presence of earthquake faults. And so, um, so there are some others here that you see. And the last one I wanna point out is just underwater topography or bathymetry. Uh, now I'm not gonna talk about that much more today, but there are airborne laser scanners that operate in, um, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that allow the light waves to penetrate water effectively and to reflect off then the underwater terrain or underwater objects, return to the sensor and give you, uh, you know, an accurate result of what is underneath the water. But not all sensors are designed to do that because they use different wavelengths for uh, underwater purposes. So let's take a look at an example of um, a point cloud that's been developed from, air from airborne LiDAR technology. This happens to be at the entrance to the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, toward the top, as you're looking at this, is uh, to the west. And uh, what you see is a lot of detail, right? You see cars, you see those little bumps that are on, appear to be on the road. Those are cars that were collected at the time of the mission. Um, off to the lower right is, is the first tower near Marin County side of the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, the colors that you see here are representing elevation differences or elevation ranges really. 
So uh, the real point about this graphic is that you can see the amount of information that you can collect with an airborne LiDAR sensor over a relatively large area. And that information can, can then be turned into a variety of geos geospatial products that are used for a whole variety of uh, planning and engineering and analysis purposes. Here's another example similar to the last. This one is of a location in Southern California. And what you notice here is that the point cloud shows a river, a, a freeway, some buildings, um, and uh, also off to the off to the left-hand side of the image, a, um, an electric power line above the ground. Uh, so just a variety of detail. And it is possible with this technology also that once you have all this information, you can make say a digital terrain model by stripping off all of the points that are representing features above the ground and be left with just the ground surface itself, at least where the LiDAR sensor or LiDAR pulses could uh, reach the ground surface. Here's a very common application of airborne LIDAR mapping. Uh, it's the use for uh, mapping electric power lines. And so these graphics show you what level of detail is possible. Uh, typically for mapping these types of, of transmission or distribution line corridors, a helicopter is used where the sensor is mounted in, a, in the helicopter itself or in a pod that's attached to the bottom of the helicopter. And the corridors, of these transmission lines uh, or power lines are um, flown with the sensor. In, and in many cases, the sensor can be combined simultaneously with a camera so that, that, that the imagery is being captured simultaneously with, the, simultaneously with the LiDAR data. And in doing so, you get a very, very uh, detailed picture of the entire corridor. And then that information can be used for a whole variety of applications. One of them that might come to mind for you is, is there's been a lot of uh, press, of course, in California about wildfires and some of those wildfires being associated with electric power lines and those power lines touching vegetation that ignites it. Um, when, uh, when this type of application of, of LIDAR technology combined with imagery is applied to situations like that, it is possible to identify what are termed danger trees. So th those types of trees or vegetation that are within the corridor that could potentially be touched in certain kinds of atmospheric events, say high winds or very hot conditions when the um, power lines sag. And uh, so it's, it's possible with this technology again to define those danger trees so that they can be addressed before they become a hazard. And so that's a fairly common use these days of this technology as well. Well, now I wanna move on to photogrammetry. So um, photogrammetry, the reason I, I bother to provide a definition here is because it's a term that is not commonly known, I would say, by the general public. Literally, the word photogrammetry means light writing or drawing with light. Uh, in terms of photogrammetry in the geomatics engineering world, there's a definition here provided by the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. And it says that photogrammetry is the branch of remote sensing, which is defined as the art, science, and technology of obtaining reliable information about physical objects and the environment through the processes of recording, measuring, and interpreting photographic images, patterns of electromagnetic radiant energy, and other phenomena. And photogrammetry employs the use of both interpretive techniques and mensuration or measurement methods. Photogrammetry is most well known for its use in aerial platforms, so aerial photogrammetry. But I, I want to present to you and, and make you aware that there are other uses of imagery also. Uh, and that imagery can be collected on the ground or in space. So let's take a look at the three major branches of photogrammetry. One is aerial photogrammetry. This is where photographs of natural and the natural and man-made landscape are taken in an orderly overlapping sequence using a precision cartographic camera mounted in an aircraft. And when it says orderly overlapping sequence, in order to, make, to be most effective in making measurements, um, aerial photography is typically over, taken with overlap, um, typically 60% or more in the direction of flight and typically about 30% or more perpendicular to the direction of flight. And what that allows you to do is uh, 
3D viewing. So if you've ever been to a 3D movie or used, uh, there's some toys that allow you to uh, see images in 3D. Uh, it's the same basic concept that's used only in a more sophisticated manner where measurements can be made very accurately using this technology. Uh, photographs taken from the ground are often called close range photographs. And so hence the um, uh, photogrammetry applied to that is called close range photogrammetry. And in this case, the photographs are taken of a subject from a fixed position on the ground and using a camera that's relatively close to the subject. Uh, it can be a very powerful tool for certain types of applications. And then there's space photogrammetry, photographs of extraterrestrial subjects that are acquired using a camera mounted in an artificial satellite or a space vehicle. And uh, so when you see, for example, some of the things on NASA's website um, with images taken, it's, it's uh, likely that some of those images are used with photogrammetric processes to make measurements. Well, perhaps the most familiar type of imagery and application of photogrammetry, I would say to the public and probably to most who are listening in today, is uh, Google Earth or Google Maps. So I want to talk about that a little bit. You know, it's an incredible tool. Uh, and I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Google Earth just celebrated its 20th anniversary of existence. So uh, it's, it's a tool that is used by millions of people every day and its development in it and frankly its its utility is largely based in the application of geomatics engineering practices principles technologies and in particular photogrammetry so on the google earth website if you've been there they um, you know you open up with some interesting images and it starts with a picture of the globe and then you can zoom into just about anywhere on the earth where Google has imagery available. And mind you, those images may come from aerial photographs taken with a, a camera mounted in an aircraft, or in other cases, they come from imagery acquired from satellites orbiting the earth. Here's an example of what's termed an orthophoto that is inside of Google Earth. This happens to be of the Fresno metropolitan area. And if you zoom in, uh, you'll see incredible detail. Now, obviously I'm not um, bringing up this website live, so I'm not zooming in myself, but if you get a chance to use Google Earth yourself, either if you have, you know what I'm talking about, or if you haven't, uh, please take an opportunity to do that at some point. And you can see quite a bit of, of information in these images. And photogrammetry is produced or is used to produce, produce these images. And as I said, it's, it's called an orthophoto. An orthophoto is different from a photograph you take from a camera um, in its so-called raw form. Have you ever noticed that if you take a photograph of an object, say with a, an iPhone or some other type of smartphone, that the objects closer to you appear to be larger and the objects farther away appear to be smaller? That's because of the perspective nature of photographs, where all the light that's gathered to form the image passes through a single point in the lens and then is projected back onto the, in the case of a digital camera, is projected back onto a, uh, an array that captures that electromagnetic magnetic energy and stores it as a photograph. And so by nature of a perspective projection, photographs are variable scale meaning that the closer you are to the, to the camera, the larger the scale, the farther away, the smaller the scale. And therefore, in order to have a constant scale image upon which you can depend on making measurements everywhere in the photograph consistently, you have to create an orthophoto. And that's what Google Earth consists of, in part, is a significant number of um, orthophotos all around the globe. In addition to that, there's Google Maps. Now, Google Maps is where photogrammetry and the development of products um, using photogrammetric techniques merges with geographic information system technology. GIS technology is around us used every day, and it's used widely from uh, real estate applications, real estate management, to, in fact, being used to help track what's been going on with our uh, recent pandemic. GIS technology has been 
imperative to help those who need information to take that information and relate it in a geospatial sense so that it has geographic context. And in doing so, it helps humans and for that matter, computers to make decisions better by having that information. Here's an example again of Fresno of a map produced from photogrammetric techniques, but it's instead of, of, of having a background of a photograph, the background is produced from what are termed vectors or linear features, points, linear features, and polygons are uh, vector information. And so, as I said, the power of this map really comes into play when you combine or fuse with it information beyond the basic graphics of the map itself. You capture, say, information about um, buildings within a particular geographic area and what those buildings are used for, what's in them. You capture information about locations for recreation and what kinds of opportunities there. So there's, there's non-graphic information that's available that's related to the map. And this again is the power of geographic information systems. And, uh, and so fusing the two together creates these enormous opportunities for the user to have an incredible amount of useful information at your fingertips just immediately. And that's why I wanted to bring up Google Earth and Google Maps. And there are others like uh, Microsoft Bing um, that are out there. But these tools are so incredible and they are developed once again using the principles, practices, technologies of geomatics engineering. Well, let's talk about more capture of information from the air and spend a little time talking about small un un unmanned aircraft systems. So probably everybody has heard by this time of drones. And drones is um, it's sort of a generic term used to indicate all kinds of vehicles. They don't necessarily have to be drones that are used in the air, although that's most commonly how people think of that word, but they can also be um, vehicles on the ground or vehicles in the water. In the geomatics engineering world, it's, uh, I showed you a, a previous example of a drone or autonomous vehicle or what might be termed unmanned system that was used on the water at the USS Arizona Memorial. And here are a couple of examples of small unmanned aircraft systems being used for surveying and mapping purposes. To the left, what you see is a fixed wing type aircraft. This one happens to be a, a system called EB um, that has the capability to acquire images at altitudes of about 400 feet or lower uh, above the ground. And it can be used for a variety of types of surveillance, mapping, surveying, and other applications. Uh, off to the right, what you see is what's termed a rotary wing type of device, where instead of having fixed wings and being propelled similar to uh, an, a fixed wing aircraft or jet, it's propelled using rotors. And what's hanging down below it is a camera that serves as both a still camera and a video camera. And it can be used for acquiring images that can be um, used uh, to provide a variety of applications and using photogrammetric techniques to achieve those. Now, here I'm talking about small unmanned aircraft system because those are frankly uh, the, most, the most used type of unmanned aircraft system in the geomatics engineering world. But realize there are large unmanned aircraft systems. The very largest are, are typically owned and operated by government entities. Um, and then there are what would be termed mid-sized systems that have longer flight times. They are used uh, for a variety of, of purposes, including photogrammetric mapping and surveillance and monitoring. Uh, but the cost point goes, goes up quite a bit, so they're just not quite as common yet. Uh, also, there are, there are a number of restrictions on using these types of devices um, in the United States. 
So as those restrictions become refined and the use of these tools becomes uh, more available, then you'll, you'll start to see them used even more frequently. So I have a couple of examples here of how these systems might be used. Um, some of the applications are topographic mapping of natural and man-made features. I think that's an obvious one. Uh, 3D modeling, so urban infrastructure, electric power lines, and so on. Mind you, this assumes that you actually have permission to operate these types of systems in, say, an urban environment or over a power line, because, there, again, I want to point out there are restrictions of using these types of tools in certain types of environments, at least at, currently in the United States. Environmental management and restoration. And this is a case where these types of devices are really beneficial. There are places perhaps where it's not um, ideal for humans to be treading on a habitat because it's just too sensitive. And so this type of unmanned aircraft system can be used to acquire data over a sensitive habitat to avoid uh, damaging the habitat, or in some cases avoid disturbing uh, wildlife that may be in that habitat. So emergency response, this is another one that's a fairly common use of this type of technology. Uh, response to wildfires, landslides, even search and rescue. Uh, they're also used commonly for construction monitoring and then producing the as-built documentation that I've mentioned so many times here today, uh, which is again, the final outcome of a construction project. It's the documentation that, that provides that. Uh, and then volumetrics, it's commonly used. In fact, I have an example here. So used for earthwork mining and even determining volumes of vegetation. Another is inspection of infrastructure, such as bridges is a, is a, is a prime example of how this technology may be used, but, but also other infrastructure it can be used for infrastructure of dams, um, buildings, and so on. So here's one example where a small unmanned aircraft system was used for inspecting a dam. And what you see in the lower left-hand corner is a flight plan that was developed for, in this case, the fixed wing aircraft, which you see in the upper right, excuse me, in the upper left. And um, the flight plan was designed in the software that then gets transferred into a computer chip on the aircraft. The aircraft then knows exactly where it's supposed to fly based on that flight plan and sticks to it. And that helps in terms of the quality of the result and as well, in addition to uh, maintaining safety of the aircraft while it's while it's in the air working above the, the project site and the graphics to the right these are not photographs these are um, the, excuse me these are not photographs alone what they are, are rendered point clouds so uh, uh, an array of photographs or of overlapping photographs are taken of a project site they're merged together through the photogrammetric process and from them uh, a series of points can be extracted, a 3D point cloud, very similar to what's created with LIDAR. And then the photography that's taken is transferred onto, this is of course done digitally, but transferred onto the, that point cloud and it renders it a three-dimensional colorized point cloud, essentially the equivalent of what, we, what would be termed a true orthophoto. And um, you can see the incredible detail that's possible there. Here's another example. This is a uh, mining site that's actually a portion of which is being reclaimed in Colorado. And to the left, in the upper left, you'll see a three-dimensional flight plan that was created. This site was again flown with a fixed wing type of unmanned aircraft system. It could have been flown with a rotary wing, but just happened to choose this particular one uh, because of the size of the area and the flight time necessary and this particular tool was the best for the choice. And what you see off to the right is, a, again, one of those three-dimensional rendered point clouds. So it's a combination of 3D points that are captured through the photogrammetric process. And then the photographs are applied such that you can see all of the, the points in their so-called natural color based on the photographs. And uh, down to the lower right, is a colorful image, which is a three-dimensional um, surface created from the point cloud and, it, and the colors, the green, orange, red, and so on, um, are simply to indicate elevation ranges, blue being the lowest elevation range and red being the, the upper elevation range. And then just a little tidbit here, I threw in a photograph. If you look at the 
um, lower left hand of the screen, you see a uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. Well, one of the great things about geomatics engineering that I know um, just about every person involved in this profession, um, and I hear this so often, just one of the great things about it is that there's so many opportunities to work outdoors. And this photograph was taken during one of our firm's missions working at this particular mining site. One of our field staff members took the photograph. There was a uh, small herd of, I think herd is the right term for sheep, <laughs> not sure, but, but a small group of, of these bighorn sheep that were roaming around the upper portion of the mining site. And so uh, they got to see them and photograph them during the work. And uh, that's just, again, one of the great things about this profession is that there's so many opportunities to work in these absolutely wonderful, unique, interesting environments. And I know that it draws a lot of uh, individuals to the profession for that reason. So let's talk a little bit about the future of geomatics engineering. Now, my crystal ball is always a little bit foggy. Um, it's difficult, of course, to predict exactly what will help um, happen in the future. But I presume that's the case for just about everybody. Um, but there are some things that I see likely to happen in the geomatics engineering world that are going to be quite interesting and quite challenging for the profession. Among those are autonomous vehicles, some that we've, we've seen today, um, will be used more frequently to deploy geomatics engineering sensors like cameras and, and the LIDAR sensors and thermal sensors and so on. They're just, as the airspace opens up, as the FAA becomes more comfortable with setting the rules in place that will allow the use of these tools more, more in more areas, uh, safely, that is, of course, then we'll see more use of autonomous vehicles, in particular aircraft, but others as well, uh, in, in situations where these sensors need to be deployed. Similarly, I think the geomatics engineering profession is going to have an impact greater than just data collection on the advancement of autonomous vehicles because the principles, practices, and technologies of this profession will be used to help position autonomous vehicles, determine routes for them, and determine potential obstructions along those routes. So as, say, driverless cars uh, become more ubiquitous in our society or societies around the world, then you will see the need for experience and expertise in geomatics engineering to apply because in order for those types of vehicles to operate in mass safely on roadways, for example, it's going to be imperative that the ability to measure rapidly, measure accurately, and have that information be reliable at all times, that those kinds of capabilities are going to exist. Um, another uh, place where I see a future change in, in the geomatics engineering world is that three-dimensional feature recognition um, from software and artificial intelligence technologies or AI technology will likely advance to a point where uh, it'll be much more reliable and easier to automate identification and characterization of natural and man-made features um, that are surveyed and mapped using geomatics engineering tools and technologies. At present, there are some software available that use AI and, and use other types of feature recognition technologies that do allow some of this, but it's still not at a stage where you can completely remove the human aspect of feature interpretation and feature characterization. There's still benefit to that. And I think that will always be the case. Uh, frankly, at least that's my hope. But nonetheless, I think that these types of tools and technologies are going to become more common and be more effective and have a very positive impact on the geomatics engineering profession. Well, let's talk finally here. Um, this is, uh, I'm at the end of my presentation. Uh, and as I said before, I, I, there's so many things I could talk about. And uh, most people I know don't wanna spend uh, that many hours hearing me talk. So 
Uh, so I'll come to an end here uh, and, and answer questions if you have any. But uh, it's just, for me, it's just, it's a very exciting profession. It has so much to offer and there's so much diversity and everything that I get exposed to and have throughout my career on a daily basis. And so I'm thankful that I was one of the uh, fortunate folks to have attended Fresno State uh, in their geomatics engineering program. Uh, at the time it was called surveying and mapping. Uh, that's, that was a program name when I attended, but uh, the current term is geomatics engineering. And here's a quote off of the Fresno State website. And you see the, um, by the way, this is the Fresno State geomatics engineering uh, website or that portion of it. You see the address there on the screen in uh, the blue color. It says the geomatics engineering program in the Lyles College of Engineering in Fresno State is the first four-year nationally accredited comprehensive program in the nation and is the only one of its kind in California. And um, I want to emphasize that it is a comprehensive program. All of the topics that I covered today in one fashion or another are covered in the program, uh, the geomatics engineering program at Fresno State and uh, some of them in great depth and others um, uh, there are there are elective courses to uh, study those those particular disciplines within geomatics engineering and and something that's really important is that in 2012 and also in 2018 the geomatics engineering program in the lyles college of engineering in fresno state received full accreditation with no weaknesses noted by the Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology, or ABET. ABET is an, is an independent organization that visits some um, engineering programs at colleges around the United States. They, they have certain criteria that they look for in order to accredit those programs. And they also do comparisons among programs as a way of providing information to those programs to help them continually improve. And it's quite an amazing feat that the geomatics engineering program, which um, obviously is, is among the very top in the nation uh, at Fresno State, they received essentially the equivalent of perfect scores twice. And that is very unusual. Very, it's very unusual. It's quite an accomplishment. And ABET cited the program's strong curriculum and its substantial support from industry among the reasons why the program is so strong at this fantastic university. Well, that's it for me today. I hope that uh, everyone that we started with is still awake. Uh, and I appreciate everyone taking time for me. I hope it was uh, educational, informational, entertaining, and that it uh, created a bit of excitement for you about this profession that I and many other people uh, appreciate and love. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so if we can have any questions, leave it open. If not, I would like to thank everyone for joining us for this informational and inspiring talk. We welcome you all to join us every month for our monthly Tech Talk series featuring alumni and professionals in the fields or architectural studies, construction management, and engineering. For more information, it can be found at fresnostate.edu forward slash tech talks. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Clarissa.